Welcome to Word Connect with Pastor Maxwell Ogaga, a teaching ministry where believers are trained to be established in the truth of God's Word. For more information and free downloads, please visit www.thepastormax.ng. Father, thank you because I'm anointed to teach. Thank you because your people are anointed to receive. And together, faith is built up in the knowledge of the person of Jesus. I pray that light and understanding will come forth in and through your word. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Now, we've been looking at wisdom for living. And essentially, the Wisdom for Living series is designed to share very practical things with us to help our lives get better and more progressive. And um, I was coming to the office this morning. One of the things that popped up in my spirit was when the Bible says that the children of this world are wiser than the children of the kingdom. Now, essentially, it was talking about certain natural things that the people of this world do that helps them to make a bit of progress and that sometimes as believers, we neglect. So, uh, I, I Wisdom for living basically is to share certain things that we might overlook to add to the spiritual things we have. So this morning we're looking at order and systems, the secret of greatness. Order and systems. Order would be O-R-D-E-R. Order and systems, the secret of greatness. First of all, let's start from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read the first four verses, or the first five verses, and I'll share a few thoughts with you there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Could you use the New American Standard Bible, please? Thank you. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So we realize that stay on that place. We realize that the earth was formless. So it means that there was no shape. That's what formless would mean, right? There was no shape. Are you here? That's what formless would mean. There was no shape and void. Void would be nothing. Right? Empty. Let's see what God did. Verse 3, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Then God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. So God, if, if, even if you go to verse 14, go to verse 14 quickly. Then God said, let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let it be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years verse 15 and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth verse 16 God made two great lights the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night he made the stars God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth one to govern the day one to govern the night now follow me just to extract, I'm not doing the theology of this. I'm doing the practicality. So just follow what I'm teaching. When God saw that there was formlessness, there was void, God went into a creative process. He spoke light. He created light. Okay? So follow me. There is void. There is emptiness. God created light. He separated light from darkness. Okay? Separated light from darkness. And decided that one light would govern the day and another light would govern the night. These were to uh, help us determine times and season. And all of this process came into one day. So if I see one day, if you reverse that equation, if you come backward, you will, you will see that one day means light, darkness, light governing the day, darkness governing the night, and the separation of light and darkness. So God's approach to formlessness, God, God's approach to emptiness was to create things in order. 
He created them in order. You could see the steps. You could see light, darkness, light, separation of light from darkness. One light to govern the day. One light to govern the night. Lesser lights in the night. Stars, moon, and everything came to one day. So if you unpack one day, if you open up what is in 24 hours, you understand that even though 24 hours look like a single unit, within the context of that single unit is a process of order. Do you follow it? All right. So let's define this now. The secret of greatness. Let's define greatness so we're on the same page. Greatness is defined as finding and fulfilling God's plan and purpose for your life. That's greatness. So when I, anytime I mention greatness and success in this church, what I'm saying, make sure your phones are switched off. Just endeavor that your phones are switched off. Just do that check right now. Make sure all your phones are switched off. Anytime I mention greatness and success, what I'm actually saying is we are finding out and fulfilling God's plan for our lives. Anytime I mention success in this church, whether deliberately or consciously or unconscious, that's our definition of success here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Our definition of success in this church is a man who is finding out and fulfilling God's plan for their life, whether they have a private jet or they have a private leg. <laughs> Do you understand that? Whether the man has a jet or has a leg. What's greatness? The man is finding out and fulfilling God's plan for their life. So that's our definition. Fourth fact about greatness. Number one, anyone in the kingdom can be great. Anybody in the kingdom of God can be great. The seed of greatness is in every man. The seed of greatness is in any, any, any man. So that means that every one of us seated here has the capacity to be great. Now, what's our definition of greatness again? We're finding out and fulfilling God's plan and purpose for our lives. Okay. Number two. Four facts about greatness. Number two. People do not stumble on greatness. Rather, people become great. They don't stumble on it. They become great. That means for us, greatness is a process. Greatness is a process. People become great. They don't stumble on it. So we should stop wishing that one day we'll just be great. Hmm? Say so one day, one day it go better. <laughs> no. It's a process. It's a process. You have to become great. Number three, the secret of greatness is in forming the habits and discipline required for it. And this is important. The secret of greatness is in forming the habits and the discipline required for it. Now, let me explain this. Greatness to a musician like our sister who just led the worship Greatness to her, for her to excel, for instance, as a music person, she has to have the discipline of voice training and then the, the, the habit of voice training. That's the habit. And then what now? The discipline of maintaining her rehearsals. So if you have habits and you don't have discipline, the habits would not produce the required result. If I want to be a, a great Bible teacher, I must form the habit of studying the Bible and the discipline of consistently studying the Bible. Right? If you want to be a great footballer, you must have the habit of going to the gym and what? The discipline of consistently going to the gym. So, habits without discipline would not produce the required result. Most time, we form the right habits but then we don't have the discipline to do what? To consistently pursue those habits. So forming the right habit is not a problem. It's the first step. So greatness is found in forming the right habit and consistently doing it. So someone said that great people are people who do things regularly, the right things regularly, as opposed to people who do things occasionally. So 
How many of us have ever gone to the gym once here? Yeah, you have ever gone to the gym, either in your, either in your dream or in real life. How many of you have gone to the gym? To the gym? Either in your, if you have not gone to the gym, even in your dream, I don't think you should be here. But how many of you, even in your dream and in real life, you've gone to the gym once? Right. Now, do you think that you, with, with, I mean, having gone to the gym, either spiritually or physically, do you think that's enough to want to get in the ring uh, for a boxing competition? <laughs> you don't think so, right? Because you will see Jesus. Now, the, the issue is, everybody who is a boxing champion goes to the ring. But why does that man have the confidence to get in the ring? He goes what? Regularly. So, you have a habit, for instance, of going to the gym once. I know January will soon come. Everybody will run there. And by March, you are back. Right? <laughs> uh, the, but the, 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 the champion does what? Goes constantly constantly what's our definition of champions in this church a champion is what is a master of what of the basics now a champion is a master of the basics who does that what consistently so greatness is found in forming the right habits and the discipline required to sustain it number four greatness is a personal responsibility that's not transferable it doesn't matter how much you love someone, you can't force them to become great. You can't force them. That's why no matter how much money you make, if your children do not sustain, bracket, bracket that, greatness is a personal responsibility that is not transferable. If you are writing, bracket it. Your choice, your will, and your decisions are involved. Your choices, your will, and your decisions are what? Are, inv are involved. So, it, that's why if you are wealthy and your children are to inherit your wealth, you, have, you, you, you don't just need to just leave wealth for them. You need to be able to convey the habits and the values that made you to come to that level of wealth. If not, they will not be able to sustain it. You know, for instance, there are many things you learned in life that were conscious and unconscious. For instance, some of us, we still do it up until now because old habits die hard. You know, when you're growing up, you don't have enough food, there's only one piece of meat to your, to your meal, you know you are taught, either by experience or, or intentionally, to finish the eba, finish the soup, make sure the plate is white and clean, and then you take the meat. How many of you learned that, consciously or unconsciously, all right now? Now, when you grow up in that kind of environment, waste is not in your nature. So you realize that even though now you have money and there's still food left in the plate, you cannot try to force yourself because you can still remember your mother's voice speaking on the inside of you, that food must not be wasted. All right? Now, you now have children. The Lord has blessed you. You give your child indomie. She picks some strands of indomie and says, oh, she doesn't like this. Then you pack it, you put it in the freezer. You give her something else, she says she doesn't like that. You pack that, you put that in the freezer. Now, after about one month, that food is still in the freezer. You bring it out again. She says the indomie is not fresh. She's not eating it, so you throw it away. Now, it doesn't sound like waste to you because that's freezed waste. It's been freezed. It's, it's rich waste, right? It doesn't sound like waste. But every time you clear your fridge, you will realize that you are actually throwing food away that's not bad, but just because your child said he doesn't like it, then the food is thrown away. In your mind, you are prosperous. But by the laws of greatness, you are training that child to be wasteful. It's waste. You're just basically throwing food away. It's not that your own lasts some days and is cold. That's just the difference. It's freezed waste. It lasts some days. It's waste that goes through very rich process. It goes through the freezer, come down. You know, very, very well-trained waste. But it's the same thing. So when that child grows up with that mindset that things can be discarded at will, when I don't feel like, he approaches your company like that, and when he doesn't feel like doing the right things, money is wasted, and you wonder what the problem is, is because even though you gave them wealth, you did not transmit the values that convey that wealth. One day, uh, the remote control in our house for the DSTV was bad. 
I came back and he told me. So I called the man who was selling the remote control back then. I said, how much is it? And he said, it's 1,005. So I called my two children together. I said, as the father of this house, I have 500. The remote is 1,5. And we are three. The mathematics is simple. If three people would give 500 naira each, we would buy the remote. So they went to their piggy bank, got 500 naira each. From then till now, the remote has not spoiled. Are you, are you following that? They are the ones that protect it. The remote, stand up, stand up. The remote is there, there. Because when they see the remote, they see their 500. Are you following this now? Because it is, you don't help your children to not to suffer what you did not suffer by not transmitting the values that got you where you are. What sustains things is the value, not the material things. Are you following this? So you must make sure that if it is dedication, if it is commitment to God that got you to where you are, you must endeavor to transmit those values so you can get it. Buy milk for a month. And by the 14th of that month, the milk is finished. They come and say the milk is finished. No, no problem. Today is 14th. Next milk arrives on the first of the next month. Say, so what shall we do before then? There are two options. You take the tea without milk. That's one option. Or you don't take tea at all. There are many people in this life who are alive and well without taking tea. That's one. Number two, there are many people in this life who are alive and well by taking tea without milk. That's two. So next time when they approach the milk container, they take it with their eyes on the calendar. <laughs> it's not trying to be too harsh. See, prosperity is not in being extravagant. It's not a being wasteful. Thought you frugality. There is a lifestyle that serves as a conduct for perpetual greatness. Why would Jesus gather up the fragments? After all, whatever he multiplied came by miracle. Yet he gathered the fragment. Everything you have came by hard work. Yet you won't gather the fragment. How wise are you? Let's look at systems. So I'll do a bit of biology. Disclaimer, I'm not a science student. So if I get anything wrong, correct it in your mind and follow the message. <laughs> so let's do a bit of biology. Let's use the body, the human body. We're talking about order and systems. So I've talked about greatness. Let's talk about systems, then I'll talk about order. So let's use the human body because Paul uses the human body to teach us about um, spiritual life and the body of Christ. Okay, so we can use human analogy to teach spiritual things. So, in the body, you have 11 major systems. Basic biology. You have 11 major systems. So, you have now, first of all, what's a system? So, a system is a group of organs that carry out either one or more functions in the body. Just basic biology. Hmm? So, a group of organs that carry out one or more functions in the body. So, for instance, let's look at your uh, respiratory system, for instance. Your respiratory system, your nose is part of it, which is your nasal cavity. Then you've got your lungs, of course. All right? Now, what takes place in that is oxygen coming and carbon dioxide going out. So there are several organs responsible for that. All right? The biology class you refuse to sit in, and you jumped out of the window, you're back in because God has a way of bringing you back to where you... You understand that now? Now, if I look at your body, I see Mr. A. But if I unpack your body, remember what we talked about, Genesis? If I unpack your body, I see a combination of systems. So if I look at you, I say, Mr. John, Mr. Matthew. But actually, Mr. Matthew is a combination of skeletal systems, respiratory system, digestive system, nervous system, muscular system, right that makes you up 
So, let's take your skeletal system, for example. Your skeletal system is made up of your joints and your bones. So, every system in your body, your reproductive system, made up of... So, every system in your body is made up of several organs. Now, the functioning of that system is what makes you a human being. Is it simple? Okay. So, let's go to Matthew 6, 26. Matthew 6, 26. Let me show you something from scriptures there. Don't forget, talking about systems. In Matthew 6, 26, Jesus is talking about anxiety, but he says, look at the beds of the air. Denied that they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into bands. And yet, your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Now, look at the first line of that scripture carefully. Can you pick out three things for me that look like a system there? Sowing? It's, it's simple. The answer is there. You can't feel it. Just say anything in the first verse. You might likely be correct. Okay. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into bands. So that sowing, reaping and gathering into bands is what forms an economic system. You first of all have to sow then you would reap then you would gather into bands. Which more is more like um, income savings and investment. Your gathering into bands is keeping for future use. Okay. So when you look at Joseph when there was famine in the land, God gave him an economic system. 20% to be saved, some to be sold. So that's a system. That's a system. So now, each of these, remember what you said, is the definition of a system, the biological definition. It's a group of organs, you know, that are dedicated to one function or more than one function. So let's take your skeletal system, for example. So you've got bones, you've got your skeleton, and then you've got your uh, joints, okay? So the bones and the joints all work together and they are part of your skeletal system, all right? Now, if someone has arthritis, for instance, now arthritis basically is a joint issue, right? So let's say someone has arthritis, it's going to affect their productivity, right? Are you still here? So if somebody has arthritis in his left leg, it's going to affect probably their productivity totally. Because each of the systems in the body are interrelated and interconnected. That's what makes it a system. Okay? Now, your destiny is interconnected and interrelated. So, if somebody has greatness, so if somebody has, if somebody is very good, but they have a problem in their finances, they don't know how to manage money, that has the ability to affect their productivity in coming into greatness. All other systems in their life can be working well, but if they have a financial, maybe they don't know how to save and they are very extravagant, that affects them from being able to get to the level of greatness because every system has to contribute to come to this point called greatness. Are we together? All right. So, if you take that and put it here, you see, they neither sow, reap, nor gather into bands. So, we can say sowing is an organ, reaping is an organ, gathering into bands is an organ. To form a financial system. Now, what that means is that if a man knows how to sow, how to reap, but he doesn't know how to gather, there's going to be an issue. All right. So, and then most times again, you realize that we are very concerned, Paul talks about that, about the external look. So, let's take your skeletal system, for example. Your skeletal system is also made up of uh, part of your skeletal system is your rib cage. Now, your rib cage covers your lungs and just covers all the vital organs you have here. Now, if you want to look at, I mean, both guys and our wonderful sisters, all right, when they're in front of the mirror and they need to make up, I mean, they do all the makeup, all the nice things, and I mean, some don't even mind taking the ruler to measure the eyebrow, make sure it's two centimeters on the left, it has to be two centimeters on the right. I mean, everything is nice. And dress well, nice hair, good looking hair, perfume, deodorant. You know, some people spray and you're like, what? Where are you going? 
Are you ever going to come back from this journey? Like body spray, first layer, second layer. Like I'm going to confuse them. They will not know which pair I'm using. I mean, mix the thing up. And very good. And you, know, you have some guys, well-dressed, shoe talking. They've got tie. They've got lapel. They've got flower. They've got bangles. They've got rings to match. They take care of their body. And these guys will walk in and sit over a plate of food for 20 minutes that everything in that table is unhealthy. Even when you offer them water, I say, no, I don't take my food with water. I take it with Sprite. It, it looks like you are a big boy. But from your first plate to your last plate is unhealthy. You're not paying as much attention to your internal organs as you are to your external organs. That is how people fail in life. You are more concerned about what people see of you than the real you. So you don't mind being in debt and having a life of prosperity while you're dying silently. And so systems help you to be able to, I'm going to talk about priority one of the Wednesdays. Systems helps you, and let me just say this because I think I forgot to announce in the first service. The last Wednesday of this month, we're going to have question and answer on all I've taught on the wisdom for living. So if you have questions on any of the places I've thought of, then you can come with it that Wednesday. But So systems helps you to be able to recognize this. Now, We know you've been blessed by this telecast. To become a partner, please call plus 234-805-888-7575. Pastor Maxwell's messages are available in over a dozen books and a thousand audio and video format. To purchase this title and other titles by Pastor Maxwell Ogaga, please call plus 234-805-888-7575. Also available are free downloads from www.com. The Pastor Mark's at NG. God bless you.